This is a true crime in real time update from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. It was supposed to be the moment Delphi, Indiana had waited for, the day justice would begin to surface for the two young girls whose lives ended far too soon. But as Richard Allen, the man now accused of those unspeakable murders, took his seat in the courtroom, something felt off. He wasn't the same man the town had seen in earlier hearings. Physically different, distant, and almost eerie, Allen's transformation begged the question, who was this man really? Was he a predator hiding in plain sight, or was he, like his defense argued, a man unraveling under pressure, confessing to things that may never have happened? And if not him, then who? That unsettling question lingers in the air as both prosecution and defense attempt to peel back the layers of one of the most confounding murder cases in recent history. From shocking allegations of false confessions made under duress to the disturbing appearance of an unspent bullet and even whispers of Odinism, an ancient mysterious belief system, this trial promises more questions than answers. Can we really trust what's being presented, or are we witnessing the perfect storm of misdirection and circumstantial evidence? And perhaps the most disturbing revelation of all, hair found in the hand of one of the young victims, a piece of evidence that does not match Allen. So, if not him, then who? Could the real killer still be out there, free from the watchful eyes of this courtroom? As we dive deeper, the answers may not be what anyone expects. So, how do we navigate truth and fiction in a courtroom filled with uncertainty, public pressure, and legal posturing? And will the community of Delphi ever truly get the justice it has been waiting for since that tragic February day? The courtroom in Carroll County buzzed with a strange sense of anticipation on the eve of Richard Allen's trial. Journalists huddled outside the courthouse exchanging predictions about how the opening statements would unfold. Inside, the defense and prosecution traded tense glances, each ready to spar over the truth behind one of the most haunting cases Indiana has ever seen. Two girls, Libby German and Abby Williams, found dead near the Monon High Bridge on Valentine's Day 2017. Now more than seven years later, the man sitting accused at the center of it all seems more like a puzzle than a predator. Richard Allen had been arrested in 2022, charged with the brutal murders. To many, his arrest had felt like a sudden break in a case that seemed destined to remain cold. But the road to trial has been anything but straightforward. Early proceedings painted Allen as an unassuming pharmacy tech who lived a quiet life in Delphi, until whispers began to suggest something darker. A bullet found at the scene was said to have cycled through his Sig Sauer handgun, but Allen's defense claims the so-called confessions he gave were forced, muddled, and inaccurate, more the ramblings of a man under extreme pressure than the words of a killer. And then came the revelations that shifted the narrative further into murky waters. During pretrial hearings, Allen's attorneys disclosed a previously unknown detail. Hair was found clutched in Abby Williams' hand. DNA tests revealed that the hair did not belong to Allen. The defense seized on this point, using it to suggest that the prosecution's theory might be flawed and perhaps even deeply misguided. If the hair wasn't his, they argued, what else might be wrong with the state's case? Could someone else have been responsible all along? Adding to the complexity is the chilling introduction of Odinism and obscure pagan belief system as a potential element of the crime. Defense motions hinted at the idea that Odinist symbols may have been present at the crime scene, though no specifics were given publicly. The defense seems intent on suggesting that the murders might have involved ritualistic elements, possibly to introduce doubt about Allen's involvement. It's a strategy that raises more questions than answers. Is this a genuine lead, and will it ever be allowed into the trial as a defense for Richard Allen? As the jury selection process began, another challenge emerged. With the trial set to unfold in Carroll County, the defense requested that jurors visit the crime scene. They argued it was essential for the jury to understand the layout of the area and the significance of where the girls' bodies were found. But on the day before opening arguments, that request was unexpectedly withdrawn. Was it a strategic retreat by the defense or a sign that they knew something the rest of the courtroom didn't? The logistics of the trial only heightened the stakes. 
Given the case's notoriety, Judge Francis Gull decided the jury would be selected from Allen County, but transported to Carroll County for the month-long trial. The jurors would be sequestered, cut off from the outside world, their lives put on hold as they navigate one of the most emotionally charged cases in recent memory. With more than 100 witnesses expected to testify, the pressure on the jury was palpable, and it hadn't even begun. And then, there's the matter of the two composite sketches which had haunted the investigation for years. These sketches, depicting two vastly different men, became a symbol of the public's frustration and confusion. Now the prosecution wants to keep them out of the courtroom, arguing that they were merely tools to guide the investigation and not solid evidence. The defense, however, insists they should be allowed, noting that one witness described the sketch as a near-perfect match to someone other than Allen. Could this be the break the defense needs, or will it backfire, leaving the jury even more confused about who they should believe? Throughout it all, the families of Libby German and Abby Williams have remained steadfast in their pursuit of justice. For them, this trial represents more than just a legal proceeding. It's a chance to finally hold someone accountable for the horrific loss they've endured. But in a case shrouded in uncertainties, the path to justice feels anything but clear. As the community braces for the opening arguments, one thing is certain. The truth, whatever that may be, will be hard won. With conflicting evidence, a high-profile defendant, and motions hinting at mysterious undercurrents, this trial is poised to be as complex as as it is emotional. But for the people of Delphi, the question remains, will this trial finally bring closure, or will it only leave them with more questions? As the trial draws near, the courtroom in Carroll County is set to become a battleground where every piece of evidence will be scrutinized, debated, and fought over. The prosecution is counting on one critical point, the unspent 40 caliber bullet found at the scene allegedly cycled through Richard Allen's handgun. It's a small but damning detail, one that could tie Allen to the scene of the crime. However, the defense has already begun dismantling that narrative, pointing to William Tobin, a former FBI metallurgist whose testimony could call into question the reliability of ballistics evidence. Tobin has built a reputation critiquing the methodology behind bullet matching, asserting that such analyses are often far less reliable than presented in courtrooms, If the defense can cast enough doubt on the science behind this bullet, it could erode one of the prosecution's key pillars. It's a bold gamble. The jurors will need to weigh technical testimony about firearms with the emotional gravity of two young lives lost. Will they believe the science or the reasonable doubt the defense is planting? At the heart of the defense's strategy is the confession, or rather, the multiple confessions, The prosecution claims that Allen confessed several times detailing aspects of the crime. But the defense insists those confessions were coerced and unreliable, pointing out that Allen gave inconsistent statements and even confessed to events that never happened. It's a chilling claim. If Allen's words can't be trusted, how much of the state's case is built on shaky ground? And then, there's the hair. The detail that caught everyone off guard during jury selection, that a hair found in Abby Williams' hand didn't match Richard Allen, hints at an entirely new layer to the story. The defense will likely hammer this point during trial, using it to suggest that someone else might have been involved, or worse, that the wrong man is on trial altogether. For the prosecution, explaining the significance or insignificance of this hair could become one of their most challenging hurdles, Behind the courtroom walls, the trial is being shaped by forces that extend far beyond legal arguments. Judge Francis Gull's strict courtroom decorum order reflects the extraordinary pressure surrounding this case. No cameras, no cell phones, no disruptions. The jurors and media have been put on notice. But even with these rules in place, the emotional weight of the case will be hard to ignore. For the jurors, the isolation of sequestration will only add to the intensity. Every decision, every testimony will loom large in their minds, knowing that the community of Delphi, and indeed the nation, is watching. While the courtroom gears up for battle, the town of Delphi stands on the edge of uncertainty. The trial represents both a chance for closure and the fear of reopening old wounds. 
For years, residents have lived with the shadow of this case, first with the lack of arrests, then with the unexpected charging of Richard Allen, a local man who many had never suspected. Some hope that a verdict, any verdict, will allow the community to move forward. But others fear that the trial will only deepen the mystery if doubts about Allen's guilt remain unresolved. The debate over the artist's sketches encapsulates the trial's central tension. How to reconcile the evidence presented with the nagging uncertainties that still linger. The defense wants the sketches introduced as evidence, arguing that one resembles another suspect more than Allen. But the prosecution warns that introducing the sketches could confuse the jury, turning the trial into a spectacle of speculation. Judge Gull will have to decide whether the risk of confusion is worth the potential insights the sketches might offer. Throughout the twists and turns, the families of Libby and Abby remain the emotional core of this case. Their quiet strength has been a constant reminder of what's truly at stake. They've endured years of delays, false leads, and heartache, all for the chance to see justice done. Yet, with every new piece of evidence, the question grows louder. Will the jury find the truth amid the noise? The trial is scheduled to run through Halloween and Election Day, two dates symbolic of transformation and choice. But as the trial unfolds, it's unclear which direction the story will take. With so much riding on this trial, the jurors face a task that could alter the course of multiple lives. If they convict Allen, they bring justice to a grieving town. But if they find reasonable doubt, they release a man whose life and the lives of two grieving families will never be the same. The jurors will soon have to decide. With the entire nation watching, they'll be asked to sift through conflicting evidence unreliable confessions, and forensic science that isn't always clear-cut. The weight of their decision cannot be overstated. In a trial this monumental, even the smallest doubt could change everything. Let me know if you're ready for me to move to the narrative close from the perspective of the narrator. It's easy to see why people crave a resolution. Two girls, full of life, brutally taken from their families, and a town left aching for answers. But what happens when the answers aren't simple? What happens when the person in handcuffs might not be the monster everyone hoped had been caught? If Richard Allen is innocent, then the real killer is still out there, free to walk among the same streets, perhaps closer than anyone can imagine. And if Allen is guilty, how do we make sense of a man so ordinary carrying such darkness inside him? It's the duality of human nature that makes this case so haunting. The contradictions, Alan, a husband, a father, blending into a quiet life, all while the shadows of unspeakable violence trailed him. Was he always a man on the edge, hiding in plain sight, or did something break inside him along the way? Or, more disturbingly, is Alan merely a scapegoat, a victim of circumstance and pressure, caught in a case that needs closure at any cost? The confessions add another layer of complexity. Were they genuine admissions of guilt or the desperate words of a man broken by relentless interrogation? Research tells us that false confessions are more common than we think. Born out of exhaustion, fear, or the belief that saying what investigators want to hear will make the nightmare stop. If that's the case here, then Allen isn't just fighting for his freedom. He's battling the very system meant to deliver justice. And then... There's the hair. That one small stray piece of evidence clutched in Abby's hand like a whisper from the crime scene that refuses to be silenced. If it isn't Allen's, then whose is it? Evidence doesn't lie, but it doesn't always tell the full story either. The presence of that hair raises troubling possibilities. Was someone else there that day? And if so, why? The introduction of Odinism feels almost surreal, a detail that seems ripped from the pages of fiction. But strange as it is, it forces us to confront the darker corners of human behavior. If Odinist symbolism played a role in these murders, we must ask, what drives people to commit acts of such brutality in the name of belief? And is it truly about faith or something deeper, a twisted need for power, control, or revenge? And whether it will even be allowed to be brought into the trial? As of now, the answer is no, but Judge Gull isn't completely shutting the door on it. Ultimately, this case leaves us with more questions than answers. What drives someone to destroy innocence? 
Can justice ever be found when the truth is shrouded in mystery? And how does a community heal when it may never know exactly what happened on that tragic day near the Monon High Bridge? For now, all we can do is watch, wait, and try to make sense of the evidence as it unfolds. The stakes couldn't be higher, not just for Richard Allen, but for the families seeking peace and the jurors who must navigate this labyrinth of facts and uncertainty. Press subscribe to stay up to date on this case and all the cases we're following. Because as the twists continue, one thing is certain. There's always more to the story. In a world where the darkest secrets lie just beneath the surface. Well, they said it was an accident, but the evidence says otherwise. Where hidden killers roam unnoticed in the shadows. Well, I think you would definitely be looking at a, a blend of toxic very bad narcissistic personality traits and they will be vengeful and possibly resort to violence join tony brewski as he uncovers the truth behind the most chilling cases they said it was an accident but the evidence clearly says otherwise each episode we dig deep into the minds of those who commit the unthinkable to your point of narcissism he thinks in his own mind how witty he is yeah but he lost that jury i i was i was done with him in two minutes from unsolved mysteries to infamous crimes geez you've just talked about how you've taught yourself how to do everything under the sun i bet you did a youtube video how to best kill somebody with a knife hidden killers with tony brewski takes you where few dare to go how does someone with such a dark secret go unnoticed for so long with multiple new episodes every single day we're not just telling stories we're seeking justice listen now on apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts just search for hidden killers with tony brewski